Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about the craft of live, com- uh, live communication, where we interview experts about how we show up, how we present ourselves, and how we can actually get people that we're talking to, people who are listening to us, to do what we want them to do. That means get the result that you want. Whether you're speaking in a meeting or on a stage or just a one-on-one conversation, it's all about how do you present yourself to get the right kind of result. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to go over to our free assessment, which is at www.speakforresultsquiz.com. That's speakforresultsquiz.com. And you could take a three to four minute assessment that will help you see where your presentation skills are strong and where maybe you could use a little bit of support. And now I am so excited to have the amazing Kirsten Wolberg. So thank you very much, Kirsten. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely, it's great to be here. Well, it's great. Kirsten is a highly sought after speaker um, and she's a, So the official thing, I'm only going to read part of her bio because it's immense, but uh, (laughs) lots of experience. But the important part is that she's a seasoned leader at the cross-section of technology, cybersecurity, digital transformation, and talent management. I'm going to ask you about that later, Kristen. Uh, She's got a distinguished track record leading technology and talent at global companies, including DocuSign, PayPal, Salesforce, and Charles Schwab. She's currently a board director of SLM Corporation and Sally May Bank. And prior to Silicon Graphics being sold to HP Enterprise, she was a board director there. Uh, In November 2017, she joined DocuSign as the Chief Technology and Operations Officer. She speaks frequently in the industry on innovation, payments, technology, cybersecurity, agile development, and especially women in technology. So that's really where we're gonna focus today is how women can get past the glass ceiling. She knows a lot about that part, being a C-level executive. She was recognized in 2016 as Computer World Premier 100 Technology Leaders Master of Disruption and as an IT rising star. I think you're a shining star already. I'm going to say <laughs> rising. <laughs> what is that? Hey. You must have been 12 when you got that award. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's also been named one of the most influential women in business in the Bay Area in 2011 and 2018 by the San Francisco Business Times. And in addition to all the stuff that she does professionally, she's committed to the organizations that help at-risk or underserved groups find sustainable long-term employment. So she's a founding board member at Year Up Bay Area and vice president of the executive committee from the board at Jewish Vocational Services. So Kirsten, thank you so much for joining us. Before we start, this is a question I ask everybody. If you could interview somebody from history, who would it be? What would you talk about? And who ought to be in the audience? So I would love to interview Amelia Earhart. Mm. Uh, Amelia was, she was a pioneer in aviation and she be, was distinguished as being the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. She had dozens of, you know, maybe even more records, um, wrote books about her experiences. She was an early pioneer for women's rights and um, believing that women could do everything that men could do. 
And sadly, um, when she was only, I think I believe it was 40 years old, in her attempt to fly solo and circumnavigate the globe, unfortunately, she disappeared over the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about her for, for my historical interview, because one of the things that I focus on when I'm talking to younger women, and I think back on my career, what was a differentiator in helping me get through some of the barriers that came up along the way. And the word I always come back to is fearless. And I, ha I actually have a, a, a phrase that I use with my, my girls. I now have a 19 year old and 17 year old daughters. And what I say to them is I said, you know, always be fearless, always take risks and always, you know, don't be afraid of anything, but I want you to make sure that you stop yourself if you're going to be doing something that you could kill yourself or you <laughs> somehow die, you know, not kill yourself, but somehow you could die, yeah. right? Yeah. Don't take those kinds of risks. And, and what's interesting <laughs> is th this is a perfect example. Amelia took so many risks and I'm sure she didn't think that her um, embarking on this journey, she'd successfully had so many solo flights in so many ways, and she and then she took on this ultimate risk, and 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 she did ultimately die, and so I thought to myself, you know, I wonder what was in her head. She was clearly fearless. She was clearly someone who could see the possibility and had done all of the right training to prepare herself to take on this challenge. And she went into it. I, I would love to be able to have the conversation about what was it in your youth and in your formative years that gave you that confidence, that mm -hmm. gave you the um, just the fortitude to be able to break through all of the barriers you saw and you experienced along the way, but even more importantly, to set such high ambition for yourself and to be able to do so in, in, a, in a way that was risky because air flight was very risky during, yeah. very new. It wasn't like the jets that we have today. And so that's what, that's who I'd like to talk to and what I'd like to talk to her about. And I would love for all young women to be mm -hmm. in the audience and to hear her, to hear her story and to be inspired by her story and um, to do exactly what I asked my daughters to do and be fearless mm -hmm. and take risks just short of those risks where you may lose your life. Well, you know, it's interesting because although what happened, she disappeared and, yeah. you know, thus spawning many, many books and movies. But uh, even, but before that last one, she took risk after risk after risk and she risked failing, which is something that women tend to worry about, you know, what happens if I'm wrong? What happens if I don't do it perfectly? And we don't hear about the times that she tried and blew it and it didn't work out. We only hear about the successes. So uh, how does that relate to women getting past the glass ceiling nowadays? Yeah. Well I mean, ultimately, I think that the differentiators for women are around fearlessness and are around confidence. Mm -hmm. And that seems to come back time and time again around the, the controllable parts of women not being able to get plastic past the glass ceiling. There are certainly structural things that are in place mm -hmm. that are not controllable by a, an individual woman. But I think that, that having that confidence and exuding that confidence, I often hear when I'm talking to, you know, the mentees uh, in my organization and, and outside my organization, women tend to have this negative roommate that lives inside their head uh -huh. that is, is saying all of the, but what happens if I'm going to look stupid? I'm not ready for this. This is too big of a stretch, et cetera, et cetera. And I call it the bad roommate because I like to say, you know, if you actually were living with that person who was saying those things to you, 
you would ask them to move out because they would be a really bad roommate. But because they are inside your head, you don't ask them to move out and you let them live there. And that, and that definitely, I think, is a big, is a big part of not leaning into um, scary stuff. Well, I don't know about you, but mine mostly sound like my mom. So I can't really throw her out that hard. <laughs> you know, lot, often it sounds like my mom. So, uh, but yes, that's a good point. That's a very good point. I hadn't really thought about it. I'm still living with my mom, at yeah. age 60 plus. <laughs> okay. Um, that's, that's great. So can you talk a little bit about I mean, general, generally women getting into the C-suite and on boards, what's the difference? How does this, um, how does this, you know, is it different in tech? Is it different elsewhere? Um, or is it just because you're in tech? What's, why do we talk about women in tech especially? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give this answer in two parts. Um, Sally Blount, who is the former dean of the business school at Northwestern Kellogg, she and her, she was, she was the dean for about seven or eight years. And as her swan song, she did a whole body of research with a number of folks at Kellogg looking at, at specifically the question, you know, what structurally, why aren't women moving from, you know, moving through the different stages and getting to the boardroom? She talked about a woman's journey in three pivotal steps. The first is launch, which is first 10, you know, not so much in timeline, but about your first 10-ish years. Mm -hmm. The second phase, a very appropriately named mid-career marathon. And the third phase is around the executive transition. And the body of research that, that um, the Kellogg researchers did really demonstrated that you had to excel at each part of the journey. It was not just a matter of getting to the C-suite. What I'll say is that uh, you know in that early launch, to get yourself on a trajectory to be in the C-suite, you need to really have the, the highest slope in terms of a path of your career. You need to be um, getting to the next level as quickly as possible. You need to be getting the broadest amount of experience as possible. And there are certain careers that position you better to do that than others. So yeah. traditional careers like um, investment banking, uh, management consulting, but also um, now in in today's world, it's the fast growing technology companies mm -hmm. finding roles there because in those companies you're dealing with the newest technologies. Those companies, the growth in and of itself is giving you experiences because as as the company is growing, your job just sort of naturally grows with it. And oftentimes in those environments, you are asked to wear many different hats just because you are in this rapidly growing environment, giving you a lot of, of opportunity to grow your skills and capabilities. And you need to be going as fast as you possibly can coming out of the launch into mid-career marathon because this is where life happens. This yeah. is where... This is where you, um, you know, potentially have kids, you get married, you have, um, you get cancer, your spouse gets cancer, your parents start aging and need to move into a facility. You have all these parts of life that you have to attend to. It, you, you have a career, but you have to attend to these things and they may keep you from still going 85 miles an hour. So to the extent that you are going 85 miles an hour going into mid-career marathon, you can take your foot off the gas a little bit because you have these other things going on and, and still be going 50 miles an hour, as opposed to if you enter this phase going 35, you're gonna slow down to five miles an hour. So making sure you enter that phase um, going as fast as you can, and then once you get into that phase, it's really focusing on the differentiators. It's the taking risks, putting mm -hmm. yourself out there for jobs that, that you might not quite feel ready for. It's really focusing on, on the skills of communication, influence, and motivation. 
And it's finding um, a network of individuals who are a combination of sponsors and mentors who will help you be introduced to those opportunities. And it's also about becoming known for something. Yeah. Being an expert. And that's where I think the technology angle of your question comes in. I have become known in the marketplace as an expert in the things that you, you know, mentioned in my bio around technology, around digital transformation, around cybersecurity. And as companies today are looking at the challenges they face, Many of them are facing challenges in these spaces and are recognizing in the faces and the minds of, the, of those individuals who are sitting around the board table, they really don't have a representation that can speak with, with an expert voice to those challenges. Yeah. And actually, one of the things is that in order to rise in a career, uh, this is why I teach public speaking, you know, when, when you're up there speaking, it is a wonderful tool. It is a tool for marketing yourself. Yeah. You're delivering information, but also if you're the person up there on the stage or behind the podium, you've got automatic credibility. And then people say, oh yeah, well, Kirsten Wolberg knows about that. Let's ask her. Oh yeah. You know, I saw, you know, it brings you to people's attention. Um, and, and I, I wish I'd known that at 25 because I spent years waiting to be noticed for my, I was so great. And my mother kept saying, if you keep quiet, people will notice and you will be, you know, you'll be promoted for worth. No, not the case. Well, and, it, and an interesting story is I'm on, you mentioned I'm on the board of Sally Mae. The way I got that opportunity to interview for that board seat was through a panel I was sitting on. Mm -hmm. I was speaking on digital transformation and agile transformation and how to move from a more traditional development methodology to an agile methodology. And after the, after the panel and after the discussion, someone from the audience walked up and said, are you looking for a board seat? And I said, as a matter of fact, I am. Wow. Wow. And so my, my ability to convey my expertise through that panel keyed in this executive recruiter's mind this is the profile of a candidate that we're looking for, for this board seat. And literally I interviewed, I had the conversation with the executive recruiter on a Thursday. I flew back East on a Monday, interviewed for the role on Tuesday and was given the offer on Thursday. And for our non-American listeners, can you just quickly say what Sally Mae does? So Sally what they are. Yeah, Sally Mae is the largest student loan bank and holding company in the United States. And they, um, most people don't realize that student loans, the overwhelming majority of student loans are government loans. And those mm -hmm. about 93% of all of the loans that students get for education in the United States come from the U.S. government. There's 7% of the loans that are given by private, not mm -hmm. private companies, but non-governmental companies. And Sally Mae is the largest of the non-government uh, student loans uh, in the U.S. So that's managing a lot of money. Yes. That's managing a over, lot of money. Over $5 billion in, um, in loans were granted last year. Yeah, well, you and I have done a lot of work with uh, How Women Lead and Julie Abrams, which helps women get set up for board seats. Uh, elsewhere on this podcast, we've got an interview with, uh, with uh, Julie Abrams about that. But could you just, in a couple of sentences, say why it's important to get women on boards? And then we'll go back to talent management at a not quite board level. I think at the end of the day, the importance of getting women on boards is a more broad statement of it's important to have diversity on boards. It's important. Okay. We have seen through all of the research that diverse groups come up with better decisions, have better outcomes. In a technology environment, when I look at a team, if I have women on the team, I get a 15% higher output from that team than if it's all men. And, and that's so, racial diversity as well. It's racial diversity. National it's, diversity. It's not just gender diversity. So we, 
we start with, I think we've started with in terms of the dialogue and the conversation with the gender diversity component, but it is, is, it is very much now just more broadly, how do we represent um, race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, um, and, and it's, I see it as an age diversity. Uh, yeah. I think when you talk about the board level, we have a lot of boards that um, certainly are more senior than, uh, than probably they should be. So they're all aspects of diversity are um, really important at the board level. That's great. So going back to below the glass ceiling, uh, you know, I spent 30 years in the opera business wanting to run an opera company. And I kept getting to the short list and watching the, the job go to a man. And it wasn't until I started really working with business and I said, oh, duh, that was a glass ceiling I was hitting. Um, I thought it was something wrong with me. So typical female thing. Uh, talk a little bit about talent management. You talked about going 85 miles an hour while you can. Yeah. Um, and I want to say DocuSign has just been nominated as the third best place to work by Glassdoor. So is that um, all of America or is that international? So I, be I believe that Glassdoor is, um, does have some international companies. The majority of their database and of the, of the companies that are represented are from the US, but they do have some multinationals. And th that was just this week and we are super excited about, um, okay. about that because we do work really hard at DocuSign to make sure that we are creating an environment where you can do the best work of your career. And the, the diversity and in inclusion components are incredibly important to us. Uh, our CEO, Dan Springer, came in about two and a half years ago, and we had one woman on the board, and we had no women on the executive team. And mm -hmm. we now have four women on the board, and we have three women on the executive team. So he puts his, ma he puts his money where his mouth is. He, do he doesn't just say the right things. He does the right things. And I think as a company, that's, that's part of our, our value set in making sure that we are creating an environment that everyone has the ability to succeed and thrive and that you know the talent management pieces one of the things that when i was working at paypal they had a, a rotation program for executives to give them the opportunity to learn other parts of the business and i was asked to to move into a role for eight a rotational role for 18 months in the in the talent organization and i have to say when i was approached my response was that's unexpected. You know, a woman who's been in, in technology and operations most of my career, I was like, wow, okay. And um, it, was a, it was a great experience. Um, it, was a, it was a challenge. Uh, I was further away from, from the business than I'd ever been. And that was a very difficult transition for me. Uh, it was a different kind of work than I was used to. The employees that were in my organization had a different mind frame and a different mindset, a different education and experience. I wasn't working with a bunch of engineers and engineers are problem solvers. They're, they are trained to solve problems and to think in certain ways and be very analytical and be very data oriented. And I didn't find that to be the, the, the stereotype or the prototype of an employee within the HR organization. So um, it, it was, you know, that mid-career marathon piece of you really need to get as many experiences as you possibly can. What I didn't know at the time is how valuable that particular skill set was going to be vis-a-vis -a, -vis a board seat. Because so many, yeah, so many of the topics that come to the board are people related, right? Uh -huh. And they, it, you know, the NomGov committee, which I sit on for Sally May. Nomination and nominations governance, right? And governance, yeah. So nominations and governance. Nominations is, um, we also look at all compensation issues in, uh, in, and succession planning. A lot of the HR type of responsibilities of the board do go into a nominations and governance or, or compensation committee um, mm -hmm. 
a structure. And so having that direct experience as a line manager in that function puts me at a, at a unique advantage at the board in a boardroom and, and in those, um, in those non-gov conversations, because I've actually experienced it at an operator level. Mm-hmm. And I, it's not just something that I, that I've observed. I've actually been driving and leading those types of initiatives. Well, so I've got one more question for you. You were talking about having to excel early on mm-hmm. and one of the things we talked about a lot in this podcast is how women wait until they're they're a hundred percent ready mm-hmm. and men are socialized actually socialized from birth really to just go for it yeah. even if they're not ready um, back in my opera days i used to get these arrogant young men who had uh they hadn't yet fi- failed they were just, you know, the careers were on a rise and they hadn't yet learned that it was possible to fail and that you could then also survive afterwards. And yeah. Usually the ones who were too busy talking to have time to listen, you know, um, when their job was to listen to me. So uh, you've said in the past that you used to think this, the trick was to be like the boys and that worked for a while. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I my uh, career started in commercial banking and back in the 80s. And I was in banking, very, very male-dominated industry. I moved into consulting, also consulting predominantly for financial services. Again, very male-dominated. And I think as human beings, we we model our behavior after those around us. And I and I've always been a bit of a of uh, an overachiever. I sat in the front row, always raised my hand, did all my homework, got all A's. I have that just in my DNA. And I didn't lose that going from school into business. So I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be the first in class. And so I watched around me um, who was in that first in class position. And in almost every case, it, it was a man. And so I started to model those behaviors and I was trying to outman the men and I started dressing like a man. I started talking and swearing like a man. I started um, really being aggressive in my behaviors, in in my body language, because I was, again, just trying to, to do the things that I saw others doing that were making them successful. And, and while I was young and while I was so far below those individuals level of power, I think they all thought it was really cute. I was adorable just trying to, you know, be, be all, you know, professional and stuff. And it wasn't until I got to a place where suddenly I was now at a peer level where these behaviors appear or, you know, right below that, that peer level, where these behaviors suddenly became very seen as being very aggressive, very threatening. And, uh, and it stopped being cute, even in the slightest. And I started getting the very, you know, at this point, everyone's read a ton about it. The language about being too aggressive, being too abrasive was another word I got. Um, too ambitious. I heard too ambitious a lot. Um, and so that started to be something that, that was holding me back. And I was seen as having a user interface issues where the same behaviors on a man were seen as being very positive behaviors. And I don't, you know, I don't know that I would have recognized it without external intervention and a number of different, it was kind of like a series of happy accidents of things that came into my life all at the same time. And it made me realize that, you know, authentic leadership really does start with self. And I am a woman. I am very proud of being a woman. I know that I have unique gifts and skills and capabilities. 
as a woman that I wasn't allowing out because I was modeling something that wasn't authentic. And that, that shift for me, uh, you know, happened about 20 years ago. I started, I almost always only wear dresses now. I, you know, so I'm, I dress like a woman. I lost all the profanity, maybe not all, most of the profanity (laughs) from, um, from my, my conversation. And I, and I leaned into those, those more nurturing aspects and more vulnerable aspects of my personality and realized, aha, this is the difference. And this is where I was holding myself back. Um, as you step into yourself, as you truly um, let your uh, authenticity be the lead, that's for me when the shift happened and opened up a lot of career opportunities that I wasn't seeing otherwise. And it's one of those things that how do you, you know, in some ways you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, I call it walking the tightrope between respected and being called bossy and abrasive. Uh, um, And, you know, you do have to assert your authority, but you can do it just bearing in mind, um, you know, rule number one in speaking is it's all about your listeners and how you're being perceived. So you have to put, put yourself in their, in their shoes and say, all right, there are things men can get away with that women can't. It just is. It's the way we're socialized. But one would hope that 30 years ago when we were marching in the protest marches with Gloria Steinem and all of that, <laughs> we would have fixed it. But, you know, it hasn't. Uh, this is a new wave of it. Uh, so, Kirsten, this is amazing. Uh, I know we're, I want to let you go. I know you have an incredibly back, busy, <laughs> busy day. So I'm thanking you so much. If you had one thought to leave for our listeners, what might it be? So the phrase I always come back to is, is tied to the conversation we just had, which is honor your feminine. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I, I had an opportunity to participate in in the World Project, uh, which is our Hello World Project, which was an opportunity to um, write something on my body and have the portrait taken, and and that's what I chose to write on you know Hello uh, or Honor Your Feminine in in my Hello World photo because I think it's um, I think it's a message that that women need to celebrate their femininity. Uh, yes. Okay. And for the men who are listening, so it's mostly women, but I, there we do have men listening. Do you have one word of advice for the men? Learn to be an ally to the women in your life to enable them to achieve the level of power and influence that men have been able to have in, you know, in, in, in the past and, and in the present. That men take for granted. Yeah. Yeah. And because we're socialized that way. So Kirsten Wolberg, this has been such a delight and an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much. And uh, for everybody, you can learn more about Kirsten on, uh, on our show notes. And I will see you on the next one. Thank you so much. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.